is the mysterious traveler, inviting you to join him on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. Where are we going? We're going to journey to the grave and learn the secrets of the dead in a tale titled The Accusing Corpse. Some years ago, when I was a county coroner, I was called in on a most interesting case. A case which had begun in the country home of Philip Drake, the wealthy stockbroker. Roger, thank goodness you were able to get here in time. I left town right after I received your call. What's wrong, Philip? You sounded so upset over the phone. It's Vivian. She's upstairs in her room packing. She says she's leaving me. Leaving you? Why? She seems to feel our marriage has been a mistake. Roger, won't you speak to her? Persuade her to stay. After all, she is your sister. I'm afraid, Philip, that Vivian and I have never been as close as sister and brother should be. She's always been wild and spoiled. Perhaps, Philip, it would be better if... If you were to let her go. No, I couldn't do that. I love her, Roger. I wouldn't want to live without her. Won't you please try to persuade her to stay? All right, Philip. I'll do my best. But I must warn you, I haven't much influence well, over her. Well, I'm all packed and ready to... Why, Roger, darling, what a surprise. What are you doing here? Vivian, Philip has told me. Now, surely you can't be serious... You know how he loves you, everything he's done to make you happy. Now, now, Roger, you aren't going to start on that, are you? Someday, Vivian, you'll get just what you deserve for walking over people, breaking their hearts. Every time I think of you being my sister, I feel... Roger, like I... please. Would you mind waiting in the other room? I'd like to speak to Vivian alone. Oh, all right, Philip. Call me when you want me. Really, Philip, no matter what you have to say, you're just wasting your time. Oh, Vivian, how can you do this to me? You know I love you, but I'd do anything to make you happy. That's sweet of you, dear. Would you mind lending me your car to get to town? If you leave me, Vivian, you won't get a cent. Not a cent, do you hear? Oh, really? Did you ever stop to think, Philip, that there might be another man huh? with more money than you? Another man? Oh, no, there couldn't be. And why not? But we've only been married three months. There, there couldn't be anyone in that time. Oh, but there was. Oh, Vivian. Oh, in spite of what you've done... I'm willing to forgive you and start over with you. <laughs> but, darling, I don't want you to forgive me. I want you to forget me. Vivian, you can't do this to me. I love you. I won't let you go. I really must be saying goodbye now. He's waiting for me in town, and I don't want to be late. If I can't have you, no one else will, do you hear? Oh, really, Philip, you're being ridiculous. I must go. No. Philip, what are you doing? A gun. Yes, Vivian, a gun. I told you if I couldn't have you, no one else would. Oh, Philip, you're insane. Put that gun down. If you don't change your mind about leaving, I'll kill you. Even with that gun, you can't keep me, do you hear? I'd sooner die than go on living with you. I'm going. And you're not going to stop. Oh, you... You shot... Vivian. Philip. Philip, Philip, what happened? I, I thought I heard... Vivian. Roger. Is she dead? Yes. Philip, do you, do you know what this may mean? Life imprisonment, perhaps. E even the electric chair. I know. Nothing seems to matter now. But, but you simply can't throw your life away like that, Philip. Oh, even if Vivian was my sister, I don't mind telling you that I always felt you were far too good for her. She didn't deserve to be your wife. Oh, please, Roger. Now, look, Philip, if, if we were to get rid of the body... Who could possibly know that she didn't leave here tonight as she'd planned? Oh, no. oh, it wouldn't work, Roger. You can't get away with murder. That's nonsense, Philip. Now, now, if we were to bury her in the woods, no one would ever find the body. Bury her in the woods? I couldn't do that. Well, then I'll do it. You can wait here till I return. But, Roger, what if, Philip, you must let me handle this. You, you'd better give me the gun. All right, Roger. Here you are. Good. Now, now, you wait here while I get rid of the body. Philip watched, spellbound, unable to say a word, 
as Roger picked up the body and left the room. As Roger, carrying his burden past the gardener's shed, he picked up a shovel. In a few moments, he reached the woods which began at the rear of the house and extended for miles. He carefully made his way through the forest underbrush until he was well out of sight of the house. Then he stopped and looked about. Uh, I, I think this is quite far enough. I think you can put me down now, Roger. I'm tired of being carried like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, let me congratulate you on your performance as a corpse. <laughs> Do you think he suspects anything? <laughs> of course he doesn't. He's positive that he shot and killed you. You've got the gun, haven't you? Well, certainly I've got it. You don't think I was going to let him discover that the bullets had been removed and blank cartridges substituted, do you? Oh, no. Not you, Roger. You always know what you're doing. I always try to, my dear sister. You don't think Philip will give you any trouble, do you? Outside of being in love with me, he isn't an utter fool. <laughs> don't worry. I can handle Philip. Now, uh, here's the key to the apartment I rented in town. You'll find my car a quarter of a mile down the road. All right. I'll be waiting for you at the apartment. I'll be there in a few hours. Oh, no. Now, let me see. Yes. Yes, this seems like a nice place to dig. The next morning, Roger called on Philip at his office. With a calculating glance, he noted that Philip's eyes were bloodshot, that his hand trembled as the two shook hands. How are you, Philip? I couldn't sleep at all last night. I kept thinking of Vivian. And what if her disappearance is noticed? People begin asking questions. Now, all you have to do is tell them that Vivian left you and, and you don't know where she is. Or oh, things like that happen every day. You've been very helpful to me, Roger. If ever I get a chance to repay you for it, rest assured, I will. That's very good of you, Philip. Uh, truth of the matter is, you, uh, you could do me a favor if you would. Of course. What is it? Well... I'm in the midst of a business deal, and I find myself a little short of capital. If you could lend me some money, I'd appreciate it. Oh, certainly, Roger. How much do you need? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand? That's quite a lot. Naturally, Philip, if you feel you can't lend it to me, I'll go to a bank and try to borrow oh, it. it isn't that I can't lend it to you, Roger. It's just that the amount surprised me. Uh, shall I make the check out to you? Uh, yes, if you please. All right. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this, Philip. As Philip wrote out a check for $20,000, Roger smiled. Things were working out just as he had planned. Well, an hour later, Roger entered an old brownstone house and went to apartment 2C. Roger, did you get it? <laughs> what does this look like? Oh, Roger, that's wonderful. Now we can clear out and... Why, there isn't a hundred thousand here. <laughs> no, my dear. I only got twenty thousand from him. But we were after a hundred thousand. Why didn't you get it all this morning when you saw him? My dear Vivian, it simply isn't done that way. Uh, blackmail is an art. An art that calls for the use of psychology. Philip will give us many times over the money I hold in my hand. All in due time, of course. You mean I'll have to go on hiding in this miserable apartment until you finish your little game with him? Never being able to leave it for fear someone will recognize it. Come, come now, Vivian. You've got the radio and books I and won't other... spend weeks in this apartment, I tell you. I won't... My arm! You'll do exactly as I say, Vivian. Exactly. Do you understand? Roger, my arm. You're hurting it's me. It's nothing to what I'll do if you disobey me. Do I make myself clear? Yes, yes. A week passed. A week in which Roger... Patiently bided his time. For time, he knew, was working on his side against Philip. Then one morning he called on Philip at his office. Good morning, Philip. How are you? How do you expect me to be? This past week I've been able to think of nothing but Vivian and what happened that night. Philip, you must stop brooding over it. Whatever happened was her fault, not yours. Yes, you're right. Perhaps what I need is a vacation. Yes, yes, of course. A trip would do you a world of good. And if I could afford it, I'd go along with you. You mean you haven't any money? I'm, I'm afraid not, Philip. That's what I've come to see you about. 
I must have $40,000 at once. 40000 Yes, I... I know it's a good deal of money, Philip, but without it, I'll be ruined. Well, naturally, I want to help you, Roger, but 40000 If I don't get the 40000 Philip, it may mean prison for me. Now, you wouldn't want to see that happen, would you? Well, of course not, Roger, Why, but... After all, Philip, I... I saved you from prison. In fact, I made myself an accomplice to Vivian's murder by not turning you over to the police. Well, yes, I know, now, but... You, you could hardly expect me to remain loyal to you if you weren't willing to help me, could you? I see. It seems I haven't any choice. Very well, Roger. I'll write you out a check. Roger's eyes gleamed in amusement as he accepted the check from Philip. There was no longer any doubt that Philip understood him perfectly. Things were working out exactly as he had planned. Later that day, Roger went back to the old brownstone house. There was a smile on his lips as he entered apartment 2C. <laughs> Look at this. $40,000 in cash. Oh, Roger. Now, wasn't this worth staying and hiding for, Vivian? And there's plenty more where this came from. Who could that be? You better get behind that screen. No. All right, Roger. Uh, yes? CLD for Miss Brown. It amounts to $64. Oh, uh, you must be mistaken. There's no Miss Brown here. This is the address she gave. It's in care of Mr. Roger Martinson. Is that your name? Why, why yes, but I don't know uh, any... Those packages are for me, Roger. Uh, how much did you say the COD was? $64, miss. Oh. Here you are. Thank you, miss. Here's your receipt. Goodbye. Goodbye. When did you buy those clothes? This morning. You mean you went out shopping in spite of what I told you? Well, I was sick of being cooped up in this apartment day and night. I had to do something for a change. And what of my plans? You risk everything with so much at stake. Roger, stop looking at me like that. I tell you, I couldn't stand being cooped up in this apartment any longer. But I give you orders to stay here. Well, I won't. I want you to get the rest of the money at once so we can clear out. And if you don't, I'll go shopping whenever I feel like it. You can't make me stay here. <gasps> You'll do exactly as I say, Vivian. I won't allow anything or anyone to interfere with my plans. I've worked out every step perfectly, and there isn't going to be any slip-up. Another week passed, a week in which Roger made no effort to see Philip. Then early one evening, he got into his car and drove out of the city to Philip's home in the country. Oh, it's you, Roger. Come in. Good evening, Philip. Oh, uh, where are the servants? This is their night off. Oh. Uh, you're uh, you're not looking well at all, Philip. You, you shouldn't remain in this house by yourself. What difference does it make where I am? Wherever I go, the memory of that night follows. It's hard to believe that it was only two weeks ago tonight that I killed her. Two weeks ago tonight. Well, so it was. Oh, uh, oh, by the way, Philip, do you think you might possibly lend me sixty thousand huh? dollars? Sixty thousand? You can't be serious. Oh, but I am. But I lent you that much already. Yes, I know, but I must have more. No. I won't give you another cent. You've blackmailed me enough. Blackmail is a harsh word. Philip. What else can you call it? Now, you're just as hard and grasping as Vivian was. Yes, but you must remember I'm alive and she isn't. I suppose you're glad she's dead. In life, she was worth nothing to you. In death, you're able to get $60,000 for her. In death? How do I know she is dead? But don't be foolish, Philip. You saw her lying on the floor in this very room. Yes, but how do I know she's dead? It was you who examined her and told me so. And you buried the body by yourself. Well, I, I just wanted to spare you, Philip. Just exactly where did you bury Vivian? As a matter of fact, how do I know the whole affair isn't staged for my special benefit? So that you can extort money from me. Oh, surely you don't believe that, Philip. Why, you shot her with your own gun. Yes. And you took the gun away from me immediately after the shooting. 
Suddenly, this whole affair is becoming very clear to I me. I tell you, she's dead, Philip, and buried out in the woods. Then I want to see the grave and the body you say is in it. But this is ridiculous. I, I won't go searching for a grave in the middle of the night. You shouldn't have to search for it, Roger. Not if you really dug one. Come along. We can pick up a shovel at the tool shed. I won't do it. I won't do it. I, I said come you. along, Roger. Oh, very well. But I'm not certain I'll be able to find the grave. After all, the woods is fairly large, and it's been two weeks since I buried it. That's all right, Roger. We'll stay out there until you do find her. A few minutes later, Philip and Roger picked up the shovel at the tool shed and then continued on their way to the woods that began at the rear of the house. Neither of the men spoke as they entered the woods. Roger leading the way with a flashlight. Several times he stopped trying to get his bearings, then plunged on again, hoping to find a, a familiar landmark. It became apparent that Roger was growing less and less sure of himself. Oh, the grave is someplace around here. I'm certain of it. Perhaps we ought to come back in the daytime. It, it might be easier to find it then. I know, Roger. You shouldn't have any trouble finding it now. If it exists. It does exist, I tell you. It's it's just that the woods are so confusing at night. Everything looks so so different. Just keep on searching, Roger. Well, perhaps this is the spot. It it looks something like it. Well, is it or isn't I, it? I I don't know. It looks like the place where I buried her, and yet yet I'm I, I'm not certain. There's only one way to make certain, and that's to start digging. Here, here's the shovel. But suppose this isn't the spot. Then we'll dig somewhere else. In fact, we'll dig up the entire woods if necessary. After all, you're certain she is buried in the woods, aren't you? Go ahead, Roger. Start digging. Oh, oh, very well. Well, Roger, you've been digging for 20 minutes now, and you haven't uncovered a body. Philip, I told you I wasn't sure this was the spot where I buried her. You're a great actor, Roger. But I'm afraid this time you've overplayed your role. What do you mean? Vivian isn't dead. And there's no use your pretending she is. Everything that's happened was part of a scheme the two of you planned to extort money from me. I tell you she is dead. Then where's the body? I thought this was the spot that I must be mistaken. I'm sure I didn't bury her any deeper than this, but if I... Philip, turn the flashlight this way. What is it? Look. Do you see what I've uncovered? <gasps> a hand? Yes. This is the spot where I buried her, Philip. Just a few more shovelfuls and I'll have her uncovered. Oh. Oh, it can't be. There. Ah, there you are, Philip. Of course, she's been in the ground for two weeks, but I think you can easily recognize that it's Vivian. Yes. It's Vivian. And look, Philip. Here's the bullet hole under her heart. The bullet hole that you made. I don't want to see any more. I've had enough. You should trust me a little more, Philip. Everything I did was for your own good. After all, you you don't want to go to the electric chair, do you? I don't care what happens anymore. I can't stand having her death on my conscience any longer. I'm going to call the police. Don't be a fool, Philip. You know it might well mean the electric chair. I'll take my chances. Anything's better than going on living the way I have these past two weeks. I'm going back to the house and call the police. Philip, Philip, come back. Come back. Philip! Operator. Operator. Philip, Philip, wait. Wait, don't do anything foolish. No, you cut me off. Take your hands off that phone, Roger. What I want you to do, Philip, is to listen to me for a few minutes. At the end of that time, you may, you may do as you please. Now, that's fair enough, isn't it? Nothing you can say will make me change my mind about calling the now, police. listen to me first. Then if you still want to call the police, you can. Now, please put the receiver down, Philip. Yeah, that's it. Well, what do you want to tell me? Well, uh, do you mind if I mix myself a drink first? It's been a rather difficult evening. Very well. Oh, well, what about one for you, Philip? You look as though you could stand a drink. No, thank you. Oh, nonsense. Do you good. What is it you want to say to me, Roger? Huh? Oh, oh yes, say to you. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. 
Uh, here's your drink, Philip. Thank you. Well, now, uh, what shall we drink to? Uh, we'll drink to your good luck, come what may. Yeah, there. I feel a good deal better. All right. Now that we've had our drinks, what have you got to say? Oh, oh yes, yes, I, uh... What I wanted to say was I... I never let anything interfere with my plans, Philip. What do you mean by that? Simply that I can't allow you to go to the police, and therefore you shan't. It would spoil my plan. Oh, it would, would it? Well, I'd like to see you stop me. I have, Philip. In a very little while, in fact, in just a few seconds, you'll be dead. Dead? What are you saying? Yes, Philip. The drink I mixed for you was poisoned. Poisoned? Aren't you finding that it's becoming uh, difficult to breathe? Oh, no, you couldn't have. I... My throat it burns. Yes, I know, Philip. But it'll all be over in a matter of seconds. Now, I, I see it all. You, you might... Yes, Philip. Just a week ago tonight, she uh, died according to plan. I'm cool. Please... I'm afraid, Philip, that you haven't the strength left to reach the telephone. I will. Uh-huh. I'm afraid you and Vivian never had a chance, Philip. I had things worked out perfectly, down to the smallest detail. Hello, operator. Uh, operator, please connect me with the police. It was at this point that I was called into the case. Inspector Carlton called me an hour after Roger Martinson had phoned the police. When I arrived at the Drake mansion, I examined the body of Vivian Drake and that of her husband, Philip. When I had finished my examination, I entered the library where Inspector Carlton was questioning Roger Martinson. Hello, Doc. Oh, Doc, this is Roger Martinson. Mr. Martinson, this is Dr. Smith, the county coroner. How do you do? Hello. I'll be with you in a few minutes, Doc. Just stick around. Now, Mr. Martinson, you were telling me how you came to this house two weeks ago tonight to see your sister and found that she was gone. Uh, yes. Yes, my brother-in-law, Philip, told me that she'd gone on a vacation. I, I thought it strange at the time that she should have gone away without saying goodbye to me, as we were always very close. But days passed and... And I didn't hear from her. Tell me, was it like your sister to go away and not write? No, no, it wasn't. And, and that's what worried me so. These past two weeks, Philip kept putting me off when I inquired about Vivian's whereabouts. Well, tonight I... Tonight I, I couldn't stand it any longer. And I came to this house to have it out with him. What did your brother-in-law say when he saw you? Well, he was quite agitated at my unexpected arrival. When I couldn't get any satisfaction out of him regarding Vivian, I, I threatened to go to the police. Then he broke down and confessed that he murdered Vivian. When did he murder her? He told me that he'd done it two weeks ago tonight. Why, that was the very night I'd come here to see Vivian, and he told me that she'd left for a vacation. Hmm, I see. Go on. Well, naturally, when he told me he'd murdered her, I, I was aghast. He led me to the woods and, and showed me the grave. We returned to the house, and before I knew what had happened, Philip had taken poison. Then I called the police. Well, it seems like a plain case of murder and suicide. Outside of a few questions at the inquest, I don't think we'll trouble you any more, Mr. Oh, Martinson. Oh, that's quite all right, Inspector. I shall be at your service any time. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Martinson. Uh, yes. I was very much interested in hearing what you had to say to the inspector regarding the murder of your sister. You say that your brother-in-law confessed to murdering her two weeks ago tonight? Uh, that's right. That would be uh, April 2nd, wouldn't it? Um, yes, that's correct. Then you never saw her alive after the night of April 2nd? Why, oh, I know, of course not. What are you getting at, Doc? Please, Inspector. Mr. Martinson, would you mind telling me where you live? I, at uh, 425 West 107th Street. Tell me, were some clothes delivered to that address in your care a week ago today, April 9th? Uh, clothes? Yes. To be exact, a woman's sports suit, which cost $64 and arrived COD. Why, 
I know. You're lying, Mr. Martinson. I have in my hand a slip of paper that not only proves that you're lying, but that will send you to the electric chair. Doc, what do you say? Yes, Inspector. Mr. Martinson's plan was perfect, but he... he slipped up badly. He forgot to search Vivian Drake's clothing before he buried her. When I examined her body just now, I found in one of her pockets this receipted bill bearing the date April 9th. That proves beyond a doubt that she wasn't murdered by her husband on April 2nd, as Mr. Martinson here no. claimed. No, no. Yes, Mr. Martinson, the corpse has accused you from the grave of murder and has given us proof of your guilt. No, no, it can't be. I had everything planned perfectly, perfectly, do you hear? Down to the last detail. I couldn't have failed. I couldn't have... This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip to the grave? Poor Roger. What a pity. After all that planning and hard work, to be tripped up by a sail slip found on a corpse just goes to prove that you have to be more careful when you're burying people you've murdered. Now, I recall another case where a woman drugged her husband and... Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. I hope you'll join me again soon. But if you do, please remember this. Next Sunday, I shall take a train that leaves at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. Don't forget, Sunday afternoon at half past three... You've just heard Chapter 20 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, The Accusing Corpse, Don Randolph played Roger. Also featured were Maurice Tarplin and Philip Clark. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled Escape by Death. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by WOR Mutual every Sunday over most of these stations. But beginning next week, the mysterious traveler will be presented at a new time, Sunday afternoons at 3.30. Please note the change in time. 3.30 3.30 every Sunday afternoon, beginning next Sunday. This is Mutual. <laughs>